go anywhere and see everything. You can run, but you're only gonna go to jail tired. They can bring death from above. The most devastating killer for ground force commanders. Or they can be an aerial lifeline. Roger, looks like we found our survivor. They're heavy lifters and firefighters. Start your pre-flight checks and buckle in, because now it's helicopters on Modern Marvels. Helicopters. Our skies are full of them. Unlike airplanes, they offer the unique ability to fly in any direction or just hover in one spot. And when this ability is combined with lethal firepower, you get the AH-64D Apache Longbow, the deadliest helicopter in the world. At the U.S. Army's Fort Rucker in Alabama, they train pilots to fly this bird of prey. The AH-64D is primarily an attack helicopter or a gunship as we call it. Its primary mission is to attack and what it does is it actually goes to where the tracers are coming from and actually engages the enemy. They're engaging our friendly forces on the ground. With a top speed of 182 miles per hour, the Apache gets there fast, ready to unload an array of deadly fire. These are the 19-shot rocket pods. Inside each we can fit 19 2.75 inch folding fin aerial rockets. They come in multiple configurations. I'm on the inboard pylon, we have the Hellfire missile rack. These are laser guided anti tank missiles. The Apache can be configured to hold multiple rocket pods or missile racks, depending on the mission. The last of the AH 64's weapons is located right underneath the cockpit. Yes, most Apache pilots, this is their favorite weapon system on the aircraft. Um, this is a 30 millimeter chain cannon. And fire. Carrying up to 1,200 rounds of ammunition, the chain cannon can fire 600 to 650 anti-personnel rounds a minute. They explode on impact and can punch through trucks and even light armored vehicles. To control the cannon, the pilot uses a monocular eyepiece attached to the helmet that displays targeting information. This connects to the chain cannon and automatically aims where the pilot is looking. Sensors track the movement and direction of the pilot's helmet and direct the cannon where to point. So if I happen to look at a target left, right, up and down, this gun will move left and right, up and down and follow it. All you gotta do is pull the trigger. The Apache is also equipped with state-of-the-art sensors located on top of the rotor and on the bottom of the nose that allow pilots to see any enemies that can see them. The part on top of that is a new site for the longbow radar. It's the fire control radar system. Uh, we can look out with a millimeter wave radar, look for tanks in the open, get all that data to our computers. That'll transfer it to a firing solution. Night combat presents few problems for the Apache longbow. This is the target acquisition and designating system, also known as the TADS. Um, it's on the bottom side of this turret. We have a night system right here, which is forward-looking infrared. It uses uh, different temperatures and heat to detect targets. This side is the day TV side for day television. Also has a laser rangefinder and designator for designating targets for laser-guided munitions. On the top here is the pilot night vision sensor. That's purely for flying at nighttime. These sensors allow the Apache pilots to see everything, even who is friend and who is foe. We don't indiscriminately just shoot at people. With this aircraft, because of its digital capabilities, we can zero in on just those people that are doing bad things. The Apache's extreme lethality also makes it a threat deterrent. The mere presence of the Apache in the sky is often enough to dissuade the enemy from attacking friendly ground forces. Sometimes all it takes is for us to show up and the enemy stops shooting and they disappear. While some Fort Rucker recruits are learning to master the deadly art of flying an Apache, others are learning to fly the UH-60M Blackhawk helicopter. Unlike the Apache that's designed for the specific purpose of attack, the Blackhawk serves a multi-purpose role. 
This is a UH-60 Mike model Blackhawk, and the UH-60 is a utility helicopter. The UH-60 is probably one of the most versatile aircraft in the Army, and it can conduct mission from ranges of air assault operations and combat, which we can take fully loaded combat soldiers in air assault missions onto the battlefield. And then uh, we can turn around and pick up logistical supplies from sling loading water, pallets, or MRE pallets, or ammunition to help resupply soldiers. We can do medevac missions, which is picking up casualties on the battlefield, delivering to the medical treatment facilities, which has drastically increased the survivability on the battlefield. Number one and number two battery, battery utility bus circuit breakers are in. The Black Hawk helicopter crew includes two pilots. To fly it, the pilots must use both hands and feet. The helicopter's superior maneuverability comes with complexity. The key to understanding how to fly a Black Hawk or any helicopter starts at the hub. The hub is a central portion of the rotor system. It's the part where all four rotor blades hook together. The hub or rotor disc tilts to give the helicopter directional flight and is controlled by the cyclic. This is the cyclic. This provides us directional control, either at a hover or in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, a cruise flight mode. With a cyclic, I'm actually tilting the rotor disc in the direction of, that I'm pushing the cyclic. So therefore, if I'm at a hover and I move the cyclic to the right, then the aircraft rotor disc is gonna tilt to the right and I'm gonna drift to the right. If I push the cyclic forward, the rotor system is going to tilt forward, the aircraft is going to go into a descent, and I look outside and the houses on the ground are actually getting bigger because I'm getting closer to the ground. To control the lift or thrust of the helicopter, the pilot uses the collective. The flight control that I have in my left hand here is called the collective. And it's called the collective uh, because it collectively puts blade pitch angle into all four rotor blades at the same time. The more pitch I want in the rotor blade, the higher I pull the collective. The pitch angle determines how fast the helicopter will lift off the ground in a hover, or how fast it will fly in flight. A zero angle will produce zero lift. As the pitch increases, the blades will push more air downward, resulting in greater lift. Once in the air, the pilot pushes the cyclic forward to start the helicopter in a forward direction. As the pilot flies the aircraft, he uses the tail rotor to keep the nose of the helicopter pointing forward. The purpose of that tail rotor is to provide thrust in the opposite direction of the main rotor turning so that we can maintain our directional flight. Since the main rotor system turns counterclockwise, there's an equal and opposite reaction that forces the fuselage clockwise. The tail rotor counters that. It works the same way as the main rotor in that its blades increase pitch to gain thrust. To maintain a pitch that will keep the helicopter moving forward, the pilot uses his feet to control the tail rotor. If I push left pedal, then that causes the nose of the helicopter to turn left. And then I use counter pressure on the opposite pedal to stop that motion. The Black Hawk has two crew chiefs who are responsible for everything that happens from the cockpit back. We have two crew members that sit in the back of the aircraft, and they're, they're predominantly crew chiefs and door gunners. And they assist with the loading and unloading of the aircraft. We're a utility helicopter, so we want to get in and get out. And the door guns are predominantly there to assist in the suppression of the enemy and provide area coverage. The UH-60M Black Hawk helicopter is the successor to the old UH-1 Huey from the Vietnam War. The Hueys became the workhorses of the military, and much like the Black Hawks, filled many different roles. They evacuated wounded soldiers, transported troops, dropped supplies, and were even used as gunships. But while the Huey pilots flew using only visual references on the ground and maps, Black Hawk pilots fly with state-of-the-art instruments. This aircraft really takes the technology we have in the civilian sector and moves Army aviation into the 21st century. It really does two things. It increases our situational awareness so that when we have the moving map displays, it's very easy for an aviator to know where he's at and what's going on in the battlefield, whether it's an enemy situation that's graphically depicted or the GPS technology of knowing his exact location at all times. Along with modern navigation systems, the Black Hawk incorporates an onboard autopilot system known as a flight director. 
It allows the helicopter to fly itself. You actually control the airspeed, altitude, heading, or course, make the aircraft fly a flight plan with the flight director and never touch the conventional flight controls. That reduces the pilot workload and allows the pilot to focus his attention in other areas. These Blackhawks are used for many different operations and even do a little light lifting. But when the military needs to do some heavy lifting, they call in the Marines and their CH-53E Super Stallion. It is a heavy lift helicopter. CH-53 Echo Super Stallion, it's the largest helicopter in the military. It dwarfs some of its flashier cousins. The Blackhawk weighs just over 10 and a half thousand pounds and stands 16 feet 10 inches high. The Apache weighs in at nearly 11 and a half thousand pounds and stands 12 feet 7 inches high. But the CH-53 weighs over 33,000 pounds and towers nearly three stories high at 28 feet. Not only is the CH-53 the largest helicopter in the military, it's also the strongest. The Super Stallion can carry internal loads of up to 20,000 pounds in the cargo hold, or external loads of 32,000 pounds hung underneath the aircraft. It can carry everything from armed troops to armored vehicles. Well, the primary mission of the helicopter is assault support, carrying troops and equipment around the theater or wherever we're operating at to make sure that they get the supplies they need, the equipment, the ammunition, and basically moving Marines around. To complete these missions, it takes two pilots and three crew chiefs who are responsible for loading up the inside. We call it beans, band-aids, and bullets. We can take anything in the back. Or hooking up external loads underneath. It's either a single point lift or a dual point lift. Dual points are usually for longer, wider loads so that you, know, you can keep the load from spinning. The seven rotor blades that sit on top of this metal monster are the reason the Super Stallion can carry so much weight. They're so strong that the blades create downward winds in excess of 85 miles an hour. We're up on the rotor head on the CH-53 Echo, and from here out, it's about 400 pounds. Put things in perspective, there's seven of them. That adds up to 2,800 pounds. 2,800 pounds can lift 73,500 pounds. The mechanical muscles that move these blades come in the form of three GE engines that produce 12,000 horsepower. We're not worried about how much power we have to pull to make a turn or climb or descend. We've got it there at our fingertips. When you're operating in environments where it's very difficult to travel over roads, especially in the environment we've seen over the last six years where IEDs, explosive devices, roadside bombs become a major issue, we're able to move a lot of equipment over the air without that threat to worry about. Nevertheless, in these environments, there's the real threat of being shot down. If the worst happens and the engines fail, CH-53 pilots rely on an aerodynamic phenomenon common to all helicopters, called autorotation. As the helicopter falls, the upward flow of air through the rotor provides enough force to keep the blades turning. Much like a pinwheel, the pilot will lower the collective, decreasing the angle of the blades. This creates just enough lift to slow the descent of the helicopter, and in ideal conditions allows the pilot to land safely. The problem with this aircraft is it's very heavy. Um, it falls like a rock if the engines are out. And uh, you, if you give that one shot, it's going to be a hard landing no matter what you do. While the Super Stallion carries the heaviest loads, and the Apache can rain death under thousands, Survivors coming up. other helicopters save thousands, thanks in part to their unique capabilities. At nearly 125,000 pounds, the largest helicopter ever built was the Russian-made Mil V-12. On August 6, 1969, the V-12 set a record by lifting 88,636 pounds. Helicopters will return on Modern Marvels. Whether a Black Hawk or an Apache, Super Stallion or a civilian model, all helicopters have an aerodynamic versatility unmatched by any other aircraft. 
they can go up, down, sideways, backwards, and forwards. But it's the helicopter's ability to hover over a sinking ship or a survivor floating in the ocean that makes it an essential rescue instrument to the men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard. And it's this capability that sets it apart from the planes and boats that the Coast Guard uses in conjunction with the helicopter. Well, the helicopter allows the Coast Guard to do the rescue part of search and rescue. We could always go find somebody with, with some other kind of asset, but the helicopter is really what lets us go out, get somebody, and bring them home. At the U.S. Coast Guard Aviation Training Center in Mobile, Alabama, pilots and crews learn to fly and operate one of the most technologically advanced helicopters in the fleet, the MH-60T Jayhawk. It's a variant of the Navy's SH-60 Seahawk, with several key modifications that allow it to fly in extreme weather to perform water rescues. It's a very safe aircraft. I know we can go out in any kind of weather, do any kind of mission. These helicopters are made to take off and fly in winds that can exceed 100 miles per hour. Flying in a hurricane can be scary, but doing it at night can be even scarier. We have a term, dark and stormy night. You really have to rely on, on the capabilities of the helicopter to a certain extent, because nighttime over the ocean, if there's no illumination out there whatsoever, it's like flying in a closet. Survivors coming up. Pilots must rely on the helicopter's GPS and infrared systems to show them where they are and how close they are to surging waves. The typical Jayhawk crew consists of two pilots, a rescue swimmer, and a flight mechanic that operates the hoist during a rescue and maintains the rear cabin during operations. The Jayhawk conducts a number of missions, including security patrols and disaster relief, but it's primarily responsible for search and rescue missions. Modern Marvels joined this training exercise in the Gulf of Mexico. Guys, we've been diverted into a search for a person in the water. If you want to show up on scene and do a sector search and stand by to uh, recover anybody we find in the water. After the command center receives a distress call, it dispatches a rescue helicopter. It will then either give the helicopter exact coordinates of the ship in danger or its last known coordinates. The primary job of myself as a pilot is to get the aircraft on scene. Once we show up on scene, the avionics system and the glass cockpit here in this, this new helicopter will actually fly the search pattern for me. And so it gives me the ability to use my night vision goggles to look out the window and actually search for the survivor or the subject vessel that we might be looking for. Roger, looks like we found our survivor there at uh, 2 o'clock. Let's go ahead and do rescue checklist part 2 for free fall plumbing and the rescue swimmer. Once the crew spots the distressed ship or floating survivor, the rescue swimmer gets the call. First thing that will happen is they'll survey the scene. If the conditions are, you know, met, then the swimmer will free fall. Once the swimmer free falls, they'll go down to the victim, and based upon their evaluation, they'll give hand signals to the flight mech. Unlike its military counterpart, the Jayhawk is equipped with another modification, a hoist mounted on the right side of the aircraft to aid in survivor rescues. The Coast Guard's Jayhawk also lets the flight mechanic fine tune the rescue. This aircraft has the capability that if I need to, I can control from the back small movements, either left, right, forward, or aft. At this point, the flight mechanic takes control of the operation to bring the survivor on board the helicopter. I'm going to hook the hoist hook to the basket, and then I'm going to send it out the door, and I'm going to be advising the pilot as it's going down as to whether it's halfway down or holding five feet above the water. Halfway down. The pilot's going to tell me to direct him to that person, and I will give commands as far as increments and in feet where to go. Once we get to that person, I'm going to set the basket in the water. I'm going to advise the pilot that they're in and ready for pickup. At that point, I will hoist the basket, and let they'll be on their way up. When they get to the door, I'll bring them inside the helicopter. The flight mechanic will then send the basket back down to retrieve the swimmer. 
Coast Guard crews are responsible for hundreds of miles of ocean, so fuel can be a major consideration. The H-60 Jayhawk helicopter, maximum load of fuel is just over 6,000 pounds. With 6,000 pounds of fuel, you can probably plan on flying for about five and a half hours. We can go 300 miles offshore, remain on scene for 30 minutes, and return back to where, where we started. Sometimes their missions aren't far out at sea, but on land. When Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast in 2005, the Coast Guard helicopter crews got the call. And we showed up on scene in New Orleans, and we started seeing flickers of light coming from roofs and windows and stuff. And those were people that were trapped in their flooded houses. So we immediately went into a poisoning situation where we started picking people up off their roofs. Which of the first people we saw put the basket down. They usually climbed in the basket, got them in the aircraft, and then we took them to the nearest safe place that they weren't going to ground. We unloaded them, went right back to the neighborhood we got them from, and went to the next house down the line. We did this all night until daylight, and in one day we, we pick up over 100 people, and, and I did that for the first four days straight over New Orleans. The Coast Guard led the way as military and civilian helicopters saved thousands of lives. The sky was literally filled with helicopters everywhere. The U.S. Coast Guard effectively uses helicopters to save people from water, but one helicopter saves people with water. It's called the Ericsson Air Crane, and with its unique dragonfly appearance, it's never mistaken for any other helicopter. The air crane is built for one thing, heavy lifting. It has two turbine engines that provide 9,000 horsepower to the shaft, allowing the 19,500-pound helicopter to carry an additional 20,000 pounds. This capability makes the air crane a perfect tool for fighting large forest and brush fires. The air crane can be fitted with a 2,650-gallon tank that can be filled with a suctioning device called a ram scoop hydrofoil. It can fill the tank in less than 40 seconds. This tank empties over a 265,000 square foot area and can extinguish fires that might take ground crews precious hours to control and put out. While the heavy lifting Ericsson air crane may dominate our construction sites and fire lines, Another much smaller, much less expensive helicopter dominates the skies above our cities. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, Coast Guardsmen rescued more than 33,500 people. It was the largest rescue mission in U.S. Coast Guard history. Helicopters will return on Modern Marvels. This is the helicopter that dominated the civilian market for nearly four decades. It's called the Bell Jet Ranger. The Bell helicopter was the first helicopter that really uh, was successful in the commercial market. And the ones that you see on TV, for instance, in old movies. Born in 1967, it soon became a favorite of police departments, news stations, and wealthy businessmen all over the world. But these jet turbine-driven helicopters came with a high price tag. By 1971, they cost nearly $115,000. That's the equivalent of nearly $600,000 today. Ex-Bell engineer Frank Robinson decided he could make a helicopter that would be cheaper to fly and maintain. In 1979, Robinson Helicopters started to manufacture the two-seat R-22, selling them for the same price as a high-end luxury car, about $40,000. They still make the R-22 today. Robinson began selling the R-44, a four-seat version in 1992 for $235,000. While Bell's jet helicopters still fill a role for many companies, in 1988, Robinson's helicopters first sold more than Bell, and they've done so every year since. Robinson started with a cheaper, more efficient engine. The R22 model uses a four-cylinder piston engine instead of a jet turbine while the larger R44 uses a six-cylinder engine. That is by far the most practical type of engine to use in a small, light helicopter like ours because it burns a lot less fuel than a turbine. Though less powerful than turbine engines, they still push the R22 up to a top speed of 110 miles per hour. 
and the R-44 to a top speed of 135 miles per hour, giving them both a range of over 350 miles. Along with an economical engine, Robinson streamlined the design of his helicopters. Well, we've kept the design very simple, very lightweight, and yet very, very reliable. The features of our helicopters are designed for efficiency, for speed, to keep the noise level down. And what you probably recognize if you see one flying over, it tells you that it's one of ours. It has a tall mast. The rotor is up considerably higher than the rest of the fuselage. And we do that because it allows us to use a large diameter rotor, which is more efficient than a smaller diameter rotor. The larger mast allows the blades to extend over the aft rotor. But before they fly, they all start out as nuts and bolts and sheet metal. The raw materials come in one door, and they end up going out another door as a finished flying helicopter. Nearly every part of every Robinson helicopter is made in-house, entirely built by hand. And that process starts with cutting and shaping the metal into specific sizes to be sent to the sub-assemblies. This is where all the parts are constructed before being sent to final assembly. Here, parts like the tail boom, rotor blades, cabin, and landing skids are assembled into a complete helicopter shell. And then the helicopter is moved on its landing gear on down the assembly line, getting its electrical harness installed, its gearbox is put in, and the engine is installed. After the helicopter is completely assembled, it's painted, flight tested, and ready for the customer to fly at home. Robinson's simple design allowed the company to produce nearly 900 helicopters in 2008 at its manufacturing facility in Torrance, California. No helicopter manufacturer had ever produced that many in a single year. Of course, they cost a little more now. The R-22 sells for $243,000, and the R-44 for nearly $400,000. One agency that realizes the value of a Robinson helicopter is the El Monte, California Police Department. They maintain a fleet of three R-44 helicopters that have been converted for police use. You have a high candle power searchlight, which is used to illuminate ground person at night. We also have the FLIR, which is the forward-looking infrared, which enables the observer to see heat signatures on the ground at night and even during the day. We also have a different radio package, which allows us to talk to a wide variety of police agencies within the Los Angeles County. And there's other equipment, such as LoJack, which is a vehicle locating device. Even with these extra add-ons, Robinson helicopters operate for a third of the cost of larger, more expensive police helicopters. That allows us to have three and allows us to stay in business and do what we do best, and that's providing a safe aerial platform and a safe environment for the citizens we serve. Having that helicopter in the sky is equivalent to having anywhere from five to eight ground officers in the area and also gives the police a significant advantage. The police pilot relies on ground communication to get the helicopter into the right position. Once he locates the fleeing suspect, the co-pilot or tactical flight officer directs the ground forces. He will also monitor the FLIR system and searchlight at night until the suspect is apprehended. Regardless of how much time and effort is put forth in trying to escape from the police officers, they already know that the helicopter's there. They're going to go to jail eventually. You can run, but you're only going to go to jail tired. But police departments aren't the only organizations taking advantage of Robinson Helicopters' low costs. We have other versions of that same basic helicopter, which are used for TV broadcasts. So the TV stations can buy that particular model and all the equipment for their gyro-stabilized cameras and microwave transmissions are all built right into the basic helicopter. 
these helicopters end up flying for industries all over the world. About 70% of all of the helicopters that we manufacture are exported. Exported all over the world. And some of our most active markets right now are places like South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and of course all of the European countries. The Robinson fills an important niche in an economically cautious world. But if you've got the money, you might prefer one of these tricked out choppers. In 2000, Jennifer Murray became the first woman pilot to circumnavigate the Earth in a helicopter. She did it in a Robinson R-44. Helicopters will return on Modern Marvels. Helicopters aren't just for police forces and the military. Some individuals and corporations like the luxury of commuting as the crow flies. For that, many people turn to Bell Helicopters. We offer any helicopter for any need, uh, whether that's corporate or VIP travel to and from the golf course in the boardroom. Any of our products in our line currently can suit any of those needs. Once you decide on a helicopter, Edwards & Associates is Bell's completion house of choice. Edwards & Associates takes a Bell helicopter like this right off the line and customizes it from the inside out. When a customer wants to buy an aircraft, the first thing we need to know is what kind of configuration do they need? Is it corporate? Is it utility, VIP? Just what type of equipment do they need? We figure out what would best suit their mission requirements, and then we build the aircraft from that proposal. And that can be costly, up to $2 million just for customizing. It starts with an 800-mile flight from Bell's manufacturing plant. Using only a basic instrument panel, the helicopters make their way from Maribel, Canada, to a facility in Piney Flats, Tennessee. This is what we start with when we begin our completion. It's what we call a green aircraft. It has no avionics, nothing installed, just the bare bones aircraft. Edwards disassembles the helicopter to start the customizing process. The helicopter then goes into the completions hangar, where workers install the wiring and flight instruments. Workers run wiring through the helicopter to connect the instrument panel in the front to the computer systems that control it, placed in a rear compartment. After we finish the installation of the avionics and all the wiring and we've buttoned up all the panels, this is when we start to install the interior. Customizing the interior starts with a plastic trim kit that will cover any wiring or equipment that was previously installed. Next comes carpet. And if you don't want a solid color, we can have something such as this or this. All we got to do is get your design that you want, have a computer rendering done of it, and sent to the carpet company where they can manufacture it, whatever your logo is, however you want it to look. The seat covers come with the same options. Once the customer has chosen the colors and materials for the seats, they're handmade and installed. The next step is plating. We have several examples here of some plating. Here's some door trim. This goes around where you open the door. There's hundreds of colors of plating, different styles, of brushed aluminum, brushed gold, whatever you would like to have. If we put reclining seats in, we've had cabinets up where they could talk on the phone or work on their laptop. We have monitors that actually would rise up. The sky is the limit. Anything you want to do. But they aren't finished yet. The last step is the paint. And this is where the customer can really make the helicopter his or her own. In just four months, the workers at Edwards & Associates take a helicopter straight off the line and turn it into a hovering luxury suite. For those that can't afford an Edwards conversion, there's still hope. Rotorway International in Chandler, Arizona, manufactures experimental helicopter kits that deliver to your door. An experimental helicopter is a helicopter that is within easy reach of anybody to purchase and it allows them to build the helicopter themselves. It also allows them to invest their time and save exponential dollars. Rotorway's two-seat A600 Talon is just over $100,000, some assembly required. It 
can fly as fast as 100 miles per hour. It can reach a ceiling height of approximately 8,000 to 10,000 feet and it is designed to give everyone the satisfaction of flying in a helicopter. We think that anybody can build this helicopter. Rotorway tries to make it easy on the garage mechanic. They assemble some of the more complex components for the customer, including the drive assembly, tail boom, and most importantly, the engine. We will send you a proven, dyno-tested, ready-to-install engine for your helicopter. One man that knows all about building a Rotorway helicopter is flight instructor Chris Strachan, who's building his third A600 Talon at his hangar in Van Nuys, California. It's a very simple process. They do most of the difficult stuff. And it's this 49%, 51% rule. The 49% that they do is all the difficult stuff. And then the other 51 is you just putting bolts together and brackets and actually putting it together. It's almost like you just need your normal tools that you have in your backyard. That's pretty much all you need. Here at the factory, we make the parts cards where we take each part that you need, put it on the parts card, laminate it. Put it in your crate, and you're good to go. Each parts card has a specific label on them with on your blueprints, explains to you exactly where each part needs to go. What I really like is rather than getting a box of bolts, they kind of shrink wrap them onto the card, each bolt with a number, exactly where it goes. As a first time builder, we supply you with construction manuals and videos, which take you step by step through each phase. Then it's up to the customer. First step, order stage one of four shipments of crates. The customer then decides when to receive the next shipment. When you are ready for stage two of your helicopter kit, it will include some very high-end components, which are the drive and main drive systems and the body. The main drive system is a very intricate part of the helicopter, and that is the second step you will take. The drive assembly is what links the engine to the rotor blades. The helicopter begins to take shape at this stage. Once you receive group three, that will include your tail rotor system, some of your main drive pulleys, your oil system, and your engine cooling system. Four will include your engine, your rotor blades, and your ignition system. Once you receive this final stage, you will pretty much be able to complete your helicopter. Rotorway says the average builder takes 400 to 650 hours to complete his helicopter. Rotorway monitors each stage. We will not allow you to go to the next stage of your build until we feel confident that you've reached the goal or accomplished what we are asking you to accomplish before the next stage is taken on. Once the helicopter is completely built, it still can't be flown. The customer must contact a local FAA representative and have them look over the helicopter. They will take you through a sign-off procedure where they will inspect your helicopter, be sure it's built correctly. Finally, it's given an airworthiness certificate. Then the owner is free to fly his brand new helicopter. Most people don't realize that. For the price of a, you know, a good Corvette, I can have a helicopter that can fly pretty much anywhere. Why even drive somewhere where you can fly? So perhaps you too will be flying a helicopter soon. But don't try this. For your close-ups, you'll want one of these. Rotoway is the oldest helicopter kit company in the world. In 1967, its Scorpion model became the first kit helicopter on the market. Helicopters will return on Modern Marvels. Today, not all helicopters have a pilot inside. Take the Fire Scout from Northrop Grumman. It's linked to a ground control facility that will give it coordinates. Once programmed, it can fly to an assigned area, perform its mission, and return home. It can even autonomously take off from and land on a moving aircraft carrier. Northrop Grumman modified a full-size Schweitzer 333 to create the Fire Scout. It has a top speed of 145 miles per hour, Although the original intent was to use the Fire Scout to provide reconnaissance, it can be outfitted with rocket launchers and laser-guided missiles. The Fire Scout is certainly a successful pilotless helicopter, but in the future, 
Perhaps pilotless helicopters will look and behave more like this one. It's called the Dragonflyer X-6. It's an intelligent self-flying helicopter that changes all the rules of how a helicopter flies. It's called the Dragonflyer X-6. It's a six-rotor VTOL helicopter that we designed in our factory. Dragonfly Innovations in Saskatoon, Canada, developed the X-6 to be a new breed of helicopter, winning Popular Science's Best of What's New Award in the aviation and space category in 2008. It can be controlled via the computer or via a pilot on the ground. The secret behind this high-tech flyer is the carefully calibrated computer calculates every move the Dragon Flyer makes. It's virtually a flying computer. There is very complicated software on board to make it fly very stable that typical helicopters don't have. Flying a full-size helicopter, it's like balancing a ball on a needle. Now, this helicopter is unique in that it senses acceleration and angles, and it always wants to keep level. So right now, we have full control of the helicopter. Uh, we have yaw, which is this movement. We have pitch forward, pitch backward, and roll left and roll right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take these sticks and smash them around, and you'll notice how that the helicopter always levels itself. If you ever get confused or in trouble, let go of the stick. The way the Dragon Flare uses its six rotors to move is revolutionary. The helicopter changes direction by speeding and slowing up the RPM of the individual motors. So if you wanted to go forward, you would speed up the rear motors to push the helicopter forward. To yaw the helicopter right, you would speed up all the top motors and slow down all the bottom motors. On the contrary, to yaw left, you would speed up the bottom motors and slow down the top. So just the varying RPM of the individual motors will make this helicopter go in a different direction. A typical helicopter uses the pitch of the rotor blades to increase speed. This helicopter has a fixed pitch. Speed is controlled by simply increasing the power of the motors. This smart helicopter can make anyone a pilot in a matter of hours. It's even outfitted with safety features that allow it to auto land if anything goes wrong. The Dragonflyer was designed to record still and video photography. It has a special mount built into the frame to hold a camera. The helicopter can lift approximately 500 to 600 grams. That's more than enough weight to carry most consumer digital and video cameras. But the Dragonflyer's size and mobility give it many different photographic applications. The civil applications are anywhere between aerial photography, aerial videography, police work, fire inspection, archaeology. So there's a huge range of civil applications. We've even done studies on bird nests with the helicopter. So you can actually fly the helicopter up to a tree and take photographs of birds. The Dragonflyer X-6 may not have the size of some of its big brothers, but like them, it has the versatility to serve in multiple roles. They're a unique type of aircraft that our civilization now finds indispensable.